Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. I'm here with Alexandra, Dr. Alexandra Hambright Solomon, <laughs> trekked up north. I was going to bike today, but there were 20 mile an hour winds. <laughs> so so glad I, you I, opted, I opted to stay uh, vertical. Yeah. And uh, go ahead and share in the comments if you're with us, because we can't see if you're here unless you do a comment. Hey, Christine. Mm -hmm. Christine, where are you calling in from? I feel like you're, you might be in Europe, in which case it's probably like 3 a.m. <laughs> I feel like you're in the UK. Guys, throw a note in the comments if you're here. We want to see who all is with us today. Looks like there are a couple folks. Sean, I know you said you'd try to make it. Yes, UK. Yes. Christine, how are the Sexual Freedom Awards that you went to? Let us know. Oh, Netherlands, beautiful. Let us know a tidbit from the uh, Sexual Freedom Awards you went to. Mm. Robert, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thanks for joining. I feel like you were one of the first people to RSVP for this. <laughs> Robert, what? Uh, I know you're a voracious reader. Let us know one of the books that you're reading now that you're really enjoying. Mm -hmm. Guys, if you're in the chat, throw a comment and let us know you're here and we'll get started in about a minute. Let us know if the sound is good, if you can see us. You're such a good host. <laughs> everybody in and welcome and settled. Oh. Alexandra, any highlights from your week so far? It's, I always think it's a little strange. Like there's, you know, I love so much like the face-to-face -face engagement I'm getting used to. Yeah. You know, like there is engagement, right? It's such an engaging way of communicating, but it's just yeah. different. Like I want to be able to see them. I know, I know. Yeah. Um, it's been a strange week. I can't believe it's Thursday. Like it's, yeah. my, it's my kid's first week back to school and really my first wow. week back at work. Yeah. And, uh, I keep getting like, wait, what day are we on? And what's going on? Yeah. And, yeah. Getting back in from the holiday break and, mm -hmm. and everything. Mm -hmm. What ages are your kids now? So we have a 17 year old son, so okay. a junior in high school and a 15 year old daughter who is a freshman. Okay. So, yeah. So we're actually going to go look at a college program next week. We've Ooh. got a couple of college tours coming uh, up. And yep. ACT yep. and all, all, the all of those things. Yep. It's, mm -hmm. Oh, it's a journey. Mm -hmm. it's a well, and that is, like, I think so much about parenting, like, you think you get, you're like, okay, so I've got this figured out. i got my head and my heart around what we're doing, and then and then your child, like, makes another developmental transition. Like, wait, okay, <laughs> i got to figure this whole thing out. Okay, teenager, what does that stir up in me? Who am I to this teenager? Like, I just thought I had it figured out, and then yeah. you went and changed. You and I were actually kind of talking about that before we could record, just, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as whether you're a teacher or a parent. Um, or even mentoring someone. It's like the experiences that they're going through personally that you're trying to sort of support them with bring up your own stuff. In you. 100%, right? Yeah. Yes. And being, I think, especially, right, like that's my whole, like, I really feel like relationships are classrooms, right? Like that's sort of my whole yeah. shtick. Relationships yeah. are classrooms. Like they're always offering us lessons about who we are. And I yeah. mostly talk about that in terms of like intimate partner yeah. relationships, but the other way that plays out so powerfully, or Another way it plays out so powerfully is the parent child. Oh yeah. And around parenting, like there's similar to relationship books that I that I get triggered by. Like I, I get triggered by relationship books that are about rules mm. and strategies mm. and do this, don't do this. Yeah. Similarly, there's a parallel in the parenting book world, right? Yeah. Like the do this to your do this to your kid, mm. do this for your kid, and it's gonna be okay, versus that relationship part, yeah. right? Like what is your saying? Like what is like what is getting stirred in me in this moment? And with parents, it's so much about um, power mm -hmm. and emotion and control. Mm -hmm. um, so those discipline mm -hmm. books are about like how to help your kid behave better. And you kind of miss that if you're focusing on like how to change your kid's behavior, you miss those lessons about like what stirs in me oh, yeah. when, the, when the space feels out of control. And what does that remind me of from my childhood and other experiences I've had where things feel out of control? And so there's a way I think sometimes those parenting books that are really rule based, mm. like kind of reinforce the idea that the problem is just make the other different. Yeah. You know, you're going to yeah. miss the whole chance to, to focus in on like what's going on. Yeah. I can relate to that so much because I think I first got into the relationship space and understanding dating um, through a lot of those types of, you know, experts, dating experts that are extremely rules-based. And I feel like so much of their content comes from a place of like, 
power dynamics and scarcity and who has the upper hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I found people like Mark Groves and, you know, Esther and Terry Real and, um, and that whole suite of folks that helped me understand, like, it's really about, it's about relational self-awareness, which is kind of like your big thing from your first book, mm -hmm. which I feel like is kind of a good segue. For right. us. <laughs> we can dive in. Um, so great. We've got a, a bunch of folks here. Uh, Dawn, welcome, welcome. Oh, New Zealand. Wonderful. Okay, so we'll, hmm. we'll dive in. And I know, I know it's the middle of the work day, so a lot of folks will be catching us on the replay, which is wonderful. Um, so you have one book that's been wildly popular, Loving Bravely, and you have another one coming out, Taking Sexy Back. So we'll get to that second one um, in a little bit. But I wanted to start with the first one. Um, you keep hammering home in the book this, uh, this idea of relational self-awareness and it being the number one quality to look for when you're entering into a partnership. So I'm wondering if you can describe what you mean by it and how, if someone is, um, you know, looking for a partner, how they might go about um, finding those green flags of like strong relational self-awareness. Right, 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 right. Yeah, that was, I mean, this whole, so love, the Loving Bravely book was really born out of my years working as a therapist and um, somebody who teaches and trains. So we're sitting here in this beautiful building. It was Once was your building, mm -hmm. once was my mm -hmm. building on Northwestern's campus. Yeah. So this is where, you know, this is where I get the chance to be in classrooms, either training graduate students to be couples therapists yeah. or working with undergraduate students in this relationship education class that I've been doing for two decades. It'll be our 20 year oh, anniversary cool. this spring. And, um, and what's really clear, especially in the, well, in the teaching and in the therapy, what's really clear is that like when I'm working with my undergrad students, there's what I want them to really get their heads and their hearts around, which is such a beautiful thing to be able to access at 19, 20, 21, 22, is this idea of taking responsibility for our side of the street, like noticing and learning about the deep, like interior map of ourselves, mm -hmm. about our relationship, about my relationship to relationships. Mm -hmm. And that that really is like, that's what relational self-awareness is all about. It's understanding through an integrative lens. So it's about cognition, it's about emotion, it's about family of origin, it's about culture, all these sort of like different like aspects of it, but it's all about this like rich interior of me and the idea that the more I'm able to be curious about that and compassionate mm -hmm. about it, because this work we know, everyone yeah. in this group knows, it's really hard to look at our shit. Yeah. It's really hard. Uh -huh. and, and so we have to do it with an eye towards compassion and forgiveness and a growth mindset. Yeah. But that that's that that's where the action is at. And it's in it's so much easier to focus, as we we're saying before about kids, so much easier to focus on the other person. Oh, for sure. And that is <laughs> like that, you know, every I think every couple I've ever sat down with for session number yeah. one. It always <laughs> the session number one, the idea, like the little thought bubble inside of each of their heads is like Oh my God, thank God we're here. Yeah. Now this therapist and I can fix my partner. Yeah, yeah. And then the same thought bubble is in the other person's head. Like, oh, what a relief. Right. Finally, yeah. we're going to be able to. Yeah. And I, so I've been t like using that example for years. And then I went last year and saw um, Michelle Obama and Oprah mm -hmm. doing their interview at United Stadium. What's it called? United yeah. Center. Yeah. Um, when her book came out and yeah. she told that story of walking into couples therapy and being like, okay, I'm so glad. <laughs> Finally, like we're going to fix Barack. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and then being really humbled around yeah. the fact that it is about taking, like being really willing to reckon with the powerful classroom that romantic love is. Yeah. And, um, and so that's what relational self-awareness is. Um, and so then the way it translates to dating people. Yeah. Right, it's just can is, and that's what I believe is like the most important foundation, right? Which is what, um, which is what I think everybody in this group is is working towards, kind of growing their own. But then you also want to sync up with somebody else who's right. willing to do that, yeah. Versus defend and deflect and finger point, yeah, yeah. Or versus um, disappearing in shame, right? right? So one of those, like we know we're not in a space of relational self awareness when what we're showing on the outside is either the finger pointing mm -hmm. blame or that like, or that shame puddle, right? Yeah. When we go into shame, it's, it cuts off connection. Yeah. Right. Cause it really is like, I can't, I can't see you and I can't let you see me. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, so those areas of shame also take us out of 
um, yeah. relational self-awareness because now we're not looking at how the more I do this, the more you do this, and the more you do this, the more I do this. Right. Is that almost like a volume up, volume down dynamic, whereas like the finger pointing would be like the volume up and the shame and recoiling would be the volume down, mm -hmm. almost like a defensive mechanism? Yep. Yeah. And so those can become, like we can, those can be our, our own red flags, right? Yeah. Like when my volume starts to go up, right. that's my red flag, right? I'm finger pointing, I'm blaming, why? Why am I blaming? Usually we know that blaming is like a cover for, it's, it's like a hot potato, right? Like right. I mean, you're, it's either one of us, one of us fucked up. And right. it's, it can't be me, so it has to be you. And that's right. the time we need to just like pause, step away and get really curious. about like, what is this stirring in me? Yeah, yeah. So in her first book, Loving Bravely, which I know a lot of you guys have read, Alexandra talked about um, two responses to conflict. One is a volume up strategy, which would be like aggression, finger pointing, blaming, um, getting mad, getting angry. And then volume down would be pulling back, recoiling, um, not being able to talk about it. And they're, they're both two ways in which people kind of have a default of responding to conflict. Is that yeah. a good, yeah, yeah. good summary? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it fits with how, it fits with the fact that when we get triggered, right, we go to those like low brain, mm -hmm. those like amygdala driven, like low brain maneuvers. The, yeah. the lower, like our amygdala, that like reptilian part of our brain can't do things like hold you in warm regard while yeah. I experience some, you know, yeah. disturbance over here in my, like that's just yeah. not what that part of the brain knows how to do. And like we need that low brain because it helps us make quick decisions when right. we are in danger. Yeah. But it just... It like over functions sometimes. So you just alluded to the dialectical approach. Do you want to explain that and kind of how that can be a way to ease out of conflict? Or yeah, I love yeah. I mean, throughout loving bravely, there are these spaces we bump into where, a, going back to your initial question about like how do you know if somebody has relational self awareness? Yeah. Like it really is like. I know that I'm in a space of relational self-awareness, but I can hold on to contrary things at the same time, mm. like hold on to those shades of gray. Yeah. And, um, and so it often like shows up as a both and like, I am both nervous and excited. I am both, you know, concerned and optimistic. I am yeah. both masculine and feminine. Mm -hmm. I am both agentic and like, I'm able both to assert myself and lean into what you need. Like that yeah. sort of, being able to kind of have some like flexibility and maneuverability and hold on to two things that kind of seem contrary yeah. versus it's either this or this. Yeah. Either you're wrong or I'm wrong. Yeah. Either I'm okay or I'm not okay. Mm -hmm. Either I'm perfect or I'm shit. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Can you share the example from the book about um, the woman at the party whose boyfriend was was talking to the attractive woman. Yeah, so the, there's the example is a woman at a party mm -hmm. and the boyfriend is right, talking to an attractive woman and she steps away and she's really, she's really triggered by it. She's really disturbed. And on the walk home, she's in a, like the volume down way that manifests is she just shuts down and she can't even let him know what she's upset about. And she feels really, um, she's got a lot of like, kind of self-talk that yeah. is negative, like I shouldn't have worn this stupid dress or he doesn't, I don't matter to him mm -hmm. or he's going to leave me, mm -hmm. like sort of those that spiral down mm -hmm. into, um, into shame. Mm -hmm. And the other way that it would go depend, you know, would be a volume up where mm -hmm. she just on the way home, she's really fired up and she's accusatory and you always, and you never, and you shouldn't, mm -hmm. um, versus like that space of knowing that that was a trigger, right? Mm -hmm. She see like that watching him talk to this woman is a trigger, mm -hmm. but there's this big space then between mm -hmm. the trigger and what she wants to do about it. Mm -hmm. And there's this like piece that's about her relationship with herself, right? Can she, can she like be brave enough to kind of explore what does it stir up in her? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, this, the stuff that comes up in our relationships like ties back to these big things, right? Yeah. That are about whatever. My my father walked out on our family and yeah. I wasn't chosen. Like I, you know, and so that wound gets triggered. Yeah. There's nothing, the, the wound itself, right, isn't the problem. It's sort of, can she be gracious enough with herself that she can turn toward her partner to enlist collaboration mm -hmm. on the pain point? Mm -hmm. And can the partner be somebody who can hold it, right? Mm -hmm. Who can like sort of hold the space for it versus a partner who's going to like roll their eyes like, oh, here we go again. And yeah. you're all, you, you know, here you go with the accusation and yeah. nothing's ever enough for you. And yeah. So if both partners had strong relational self-awareness in that situation, 
how would the repair look? Yeah. Well, I would love it to be, I mean, if we, if there might be a repair that happens like at the party, right, where she just kind of tucks in under his arm yeah. or whatever, just they maybe have, um, I was just working this week with a couple mm -hmm. around sort of a code word, mm -hmm. a signal um, that, that kind of just indicates like I need to sync back up. Like yeah. I have to just, you know, kind of find you again. Yeah. Um, but if they weren't able to do that, then on the way home from the party, could she say, um, are you available to process something with me? Like kind of that going yeah. meta first, yeah. right? Like can we just talk about something that I'm yeah. feeling tender about? Yeah. And then the partner taking like a deep breath mm -hmm. and just sort of like I imagine like making this expansiveness inside, mm -hmm. right? Like I would want him to kind of take a breath and make some expansiveness inside of himself mm -hmm. and then have her tell the story, like just tell the story. We were talking and then, you know, whatever the details were, like just almost like um, the two of them are watching a movie together, mm -hmm. you know? It was this and then it was this and it was this. Without value, without assumption, um, just a description of what happened. Mm -hmm. So here's the thing that happened mm -hmm. and then layering in the feelings. Mm -hmm. I felt mm -hmm. insecure, devalued, mm -hmm. afraid, mm -hmm. um, and and I want you to know that. And mm -hmm. then what I would want the partner to provide is just reflection back. Yeah. Uh, reflection back. Can you can you give an example of what that would look like? I hear it. Like yeah. I hear that you felt really lousy in that moment. You felt really insecure. You felt really worried. I love this question. Like, is there anything else you want me to know about it? Mm -hmm. So really just like that holding that space is like, tell me more. Like what else yeah. do you want me to know about it? Right. And then um, and then maybe and then it could be there may be a space for an apology, right? So there's a tricky thing where yeah. we can apologize for things that we didn't. Right. He could have done this completely unintentional, not um, no intention, no right. malice, but just right. saying, I'm, so I'm sorry that that was a really hard moment yeah. for you. Yeah. I'm sorry that my behavior ended up stirring up an icky, insecure feeling yeah. for you. I love that. Like we can apologize for things we didn't mean to do. Right. And it wouldn't hurt if the tables were turned. Right, right. Um, let's say you have a partner who um, their instinct is to go into defense, mm -hmm. like to defend their actions. What would be a tool if they want to get better about relational self-awareness? What would be a tool you could give them to, to shift that? Yeah, I, I do a lot of like inner child yeah. stuff, like inner child imagery. And I do that a lot with my couple. So yeah. what I would want is, so right, so if, if what he would experience on the receiving end of it is this rush to be like, I was just I didn't, a, I'm not that kind of guy. Yeah. I think this is this is a really good example because it's a, it's a tender one. Right? Yeah. Like a lot of like men don't want to feel like shitty. Right. There's such a big conversation right now about shitty men. And, right. You know, like he of course is gonna be like, I'm not a shitty man. I wouldn't do that. Yeah. I wouldn't throw you under the bus like yeah. that. I wouldn't, you know, right. be like doing things to make you feel insecure. Yeah, so yeah. that rush to defensiveness yeah. makes so much sense. It's yeah. so understandable. Mm -hmm. And so what I would, what sometimes is helpful is if in that moment he can imagine and hold compassion for this part of her. Mm -hmm. This part of her sometimes gets insecure because of like when she was five years old, her dad walked out or whatever the kind of story yeah. is there. And if he can kind of conjure up an image yeah. of, of the five-year-old girl that she once was, mm -hmm. that can sometimes bring forward a compassionate part that can get bigger than the defensive part. Yeah. And then he can speak to her, not as if she was a little girl, because that mm -hmm. runs the risk of being crazy, <laughs> but just like speak to her in a way that holds that context yeah. in yeah. warm regard. It may help him like decenter his trigger, his defensiveness, right. like decenter that in order to provide some compassion. Yeah. And then what helps, um, one of my favorite teachers, this guy named Les, Les Greenberg, so you know Sue Johnson? Yeah. Emotion focused therapy. Les Greenberg is another emotion focused um, person, and yeah. I learned this from him, which is the way that relational change happens is so let's say this is a guy who has struggled with defensiveness. Mm -hmm. And then he takes the risk in that moment, in our example, and he says, oh babe, I'm sorry. You know, that sounds like it felt really shitty to you and that you felt really unseen by me. Mm -hmm. And um, and I want you to know that I'm here now and I'm sorry and you know, 
you've got the best ass in town, you know, whatever it is, like sort of make, you know, just kind of like offering reassurance. I love you. I'm with you. I'm your man. That, that what the, what, what the research has found is that the, the change loop, his ability to really cement that change that he made, that cement, that loop gets cemented in when he watches her soften. Mm. so he does a different move mm -hmm. he says I'm sorry I'm here yeah what do you need yeah. tell me more uh -huh. and then when she goes oh, you know <laughs> yeah. when she is able to stay soft yeah. and open yeah and take in that reassurance that he's offering yeah that's like then it kind of locks it in then he feels like okay this whole non-defensive thing I it works. It. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. works. I can do it. It's worth it. Yeah. So there's like that two part, mm -hmm. you know, the change happens at any point. She can do a softer startup. He can resist the defensiveness. Mm -hmm. If he resists the defensiveness, then she can really like, you know, yeah. stay open, yeah. melt in. And then, and she gets what she needs, right? Because what she needs in that moment is just to feel like, I am special to you. You do have my back. We are in this together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would almost say uh, along those lines, because I was trying to like put myself in that situation. Yeah. And I think for me, what I need is more just like for him to, to see that experience that I had, not even to like, not even to like give me the validation, you know, you're so hot or like, you know, you're the one I pick, but more like to see me have that experience, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. to me, that's almost like the, the most important part of that. So right, the medicine for you in that moment wouldn't be the validation. Right. It would the medicine would just be his ability to non-defensively say, "Okay, I yeah. hear you. Yeah, I hear. Do I have this right? This is how you felt. Yeah, and get and just get like curious mm -hmm. and like you know, and we connect through being seen in that way. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's funny because it's so simple. Like when you describe it, it's like so easy, and yet like. <laughs> I mean, how many people are stuck in a vicious cycle that's very much the opposite, right? You know? Right. And it's always, um, like, it's sort of like, who needs to change first, right? Does she need to do a soft startup first, or does he need to work on being less defensive first? And it's always, like, I always, I always shrug my shoulders, because it's sort of like, wherever, where, yeah. whichever person has their nose, right. just one inch yeah. above the water line, you right. know, whoever has enough ability to just move out of their reactivity and just try a different move yeah yeah because one little change in the cycle can change the entire yeah. cycle yeah mm -hmm. oh, and I like what you're saying too because right it may be that the, the person the woman in this example needs reassurance but it may just be that she needs witnessing so it's yeah um but she can't even if she's stuck in a blaming finger pointing mode what she's not even able to do is access okay what do I need like what's disturbing about this to me in this moment yeah what do I need because um, when in that blaming mode we get so focused on he is wrong mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he is the problem and so we're not even then we're missing the whole opportunity to figure out like what is it about this that's hard for me and what do I need instead and yeah and then we can expand out into a bigger conversation about the complexities of sexual monogamy or attraction yeah. or critique you know the pressure on women to be beautiful or we you know whatever the whole we can go all kinds of places then together like whatever when we break that reactive pattern now the couple can sort of look together at these like bigger questions about yeah you know whatever. yeah gender power intimacy monogamy you know yeah. it's so cool too because I feel like these experiences have such a bad reputation like often in a couple it's all oh, that night when you know blah 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 happened whereas really they're kind of the portal and the pathway to like deeper intimacy and deeper self-awareness and mm -hmm. you know juicy conversations and it's just interesting like when we look at it in that way yes well right because i can imagine an entire world where she doesn't feel like she can even bring this up either because he's defensive or maybe just because she has the story that i should never feel insecure mm -hmm. so if i feel insecure and i watch my partner have this interaction I can never talk about it because it's it shows I'm weak I'm that whatever that kind of woman is you know just whatever stories live in her that would keep her maybe even from putting it into the relationship space mm -hmm. and then the couple as you're saying gets deprived of this yeah really cool opportunity maybe right. to 
just explore the yeah. kind of the complexities of like, yeah, what do what do we do about the fact that there are interesting people in the world, or how do I make sure that I reflect the value that I want to reflect in this relationship, which is that you are a priority, or yeah. what does security look like? How do we define trust? Yeah, you can't even get up to that table if you aren't willing to say like, ah, oh, damn, we had this moment at the party that was really hard for me. Can we yeah. talk about it? Right, right. Oh. That was a really interesting example. That we covered it. Um, okay, I wanted to get into marriage. So, in your book, Loving Bravely, you talked about how we've overburdened marriage with unrealistic expectations and overly romantic expectations as well. Um, and then you followed with, "Let's make a vow to growth, not till death do us apart." And I'm curious just to hear, you know, your thoughts on the role of marriage nowadays. So I'm someone, I'm not interested in raising a family. So in the case where kids aren't involved, like how do you see marriage and what's, what's kind of the role of marriage? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I saw your post on this yeah. this week and I, I haven't read the comments that you got back, but I'm sure it did spark an interesting. Oh, always. <laughs> yeah. always does. It's the most engaging and engaged community. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, my my world, my worldview has been like growing up in a marriage and family therapy world. Like, you know, our field is called MFT, marriage, marriage. and family therapy. Yep. And in two, like 2002, so my um, original mentor is a um, kind of one of the founding fathers of the field, Bill Pinsoff. And he went in front of the Annual Association of Marriage and Family Therapists in 2002, and he proposed a change in the name oh. of the field to the American Association of Couple and yeah. Family Therapy. And it was at that time in like 2000, 2001, it was radical yeah. to decenter marriage and propose that it should be a couple therapy because at that time, um, LGBT marriage was not oh, you know, it. fully legalized yeah. in our country. But he also was making a point about how we really have held up marriage as the only valid way to do partnership right mm -hmm. that is our yeah our world has really held it up that you really aren't a couple until you're a married couple that has been treated as like the pinnacle and top of the yeah. of the commitment spectrum yeah. and so i think having grown up in that field like i'm i'm really aware like it's only been in the last five ish years that my field has really started to expand and actually listen to mm -hmm. consensually non-monogamous couples, yeah. polyamorous couples, open relationships. Like the, what I was the way I was trained was like, those are things that are way over here. We don't talk about it. We don't look at it. If it was, if we saw that in our office, we would, we would deem it pathological wow. or at least, at least like kind of poo poo it. Yeah. Like, that's, this is a phase. That's but, sweet. Yeah. Aren't you yeah. sweet? <laughs> like, aren't you so? And it really is only in the last like five years. Like I was giving a lecture and a grad student's hand went up and he was like, What about consensual non-monogamous couples? I was mm -hmm. like, I'm gonna have to get back to you. Yeah. And you know, it's been it's been really wonderful to like have that that conversation is so much more mainstream now in ways that I think are really wonderful and inviting and challenging. Um, and so I don't need to be pro marriage. I'm really pro integrity. I'm mm -hmm. pro clarity. Like what I love most about other relationship form, like us expanding, um, us making a more inclusive world of relationships. What I love most is it really like pushes all of us to be intentional and to have hard conversations. Yeah. Like I think what happened in a world where marriage is the only thing, it's like a one size fits all. And everybody assumes that right. marriage equals this whole list of like heavily role based. Yeah. Um, patriarchal for sure. Patriarchal <laughs> for sure. Which doesn't mean that feminism and marriage can't go hand in hand right. or non-monogamy and marriage, you know, can go hand in yeah. hand certainly. But it just is sort of like, um, what does, what do I want my marriage to look like? And yeah. that's a question that we always should have been asking. Yeah. Um, we always should have been having conversations about monogamy, about desire, about boundaries. Mm. And so I think the more we can have those conversations and people can really intentionally create what feels right and aligned, yeah. I think that just opens the door to having so much more richness and connection and 
you know, aliveness to use an Esther word yeah. um, and imagination and play and joy. Yeah. But it, it also like the both and there is that it's, it's hard. Like yeah. it's hard to have everything up for grabs. It requires bandwidth. Yeah. It requires relational self-awareness. And conversations galore. It requires conversations. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. What are some of your favorite resources for couples who want to bring like intention and consciousness, whether it's to their marriage or to their couple dumb? Uh, what are some of your favorite books or resources for um, kind of guiding them through the questions that would allow them to create their own definition of what it's going to be? Oh, yeah. Right. I really like The New I Do by Vicki Larson. Mm -hmm. That's a really great, like she just, she kind of lays out just different models and alternatives and then I think sometimes like there's as much power in being like no not that yeah. as there is like that yeah. you know I like Eli Finkel's book mm -hmm. The All or Nothing mm -hmm. Marriage um you know, I think all of the people that we talk about Herbal Hendricks and yeah Terry Real Hendricks, is above, mm -hmm. yeah I really like Sue Johnson's yeah. work I mean I think the at the end of the day I'm always going to be a fan of really conscious coupling. Like yeah. I'm a fan of love. I'm a, fair, a fan of pair bonding. I'm a fan of, I mean, I, I'm a fan of monogamy, a really conscious monogamy. Like I'm never, I would never malign or think less of somebody who's practicing consensual non monogamy. Yeah. It's a beautiful, like I think yeah. it's a beautiful journey and great possibility. I think it requires, as you're saying, lots of conversation yeah. and bandwidth. But I, I love the possibilities that happen when two people say like, this container is ours. Like this is, our, we're putting a boundary around mm -hmm. this. This is ours, and what are we going to grow? So I'm always going to be a fan of marriage as being a powerful pathway for saying this is our container. Is it the only pathway? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Right? Couples yeah. can never choose marriage and create these amazing containers. Right. Right. So it's not. It's not the. It's not the only way, but it is yeah. a way that I would like us to hold onto mm -hmm. and update mm -hmm. and reimagine. Mm -hmm. Love it. Um, I have so many questions and we're, okay. Um, so in your TED talk, you talked about, um, especially for women, and this will kind of get into your upcoming book that's coming out. You talk about the good girl and then the bad girl, which would be like the erratic self and how often we are told by society that we kind of need to keep these two separate and, you know, one is good and one is like naughty and, um, one should be hidden and one should be public. And you've talked, especially about you being, you know, a public figure and also a professor. So you're working with teenagers or I guess young adults. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious, you know, for other professional women who are kind of grappling with this, like we want to be connected to our erotic self. Um, and yet we, uh, we recognize that there are certain kind of cultural norms around that. What are your recommendations for women who kind of want to be integrated? <laughs> <laughs> I think this is such an important question and conversation. I would to I'm totally curious how you would answer that too. I it, it requires all of us to to do this together, right? Like the thing I know for sure is the split does not work. Mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. The split creates the conditions for um, violence, infidelity, harass, like all the things that we don't like yeah. is created by this idea that women are either this right. or this. Yeah. Whenever we say those are the women, you know, we do it around like sex workers, right? Like there are yeah. so many people who are consuming pornography, yet we marginalize the people who are creating yeah. the erotic materials on our behalf. Yeah. You know, it's, we make these, we make these splits everywhere about yeah. there, those people and these people. Yeah. We see it in our, in our politics, right? Us and them. Like yeah. whenever we make those splits, it opens us to projection. It opens us to like losing parts of ourselves. Like mm -hmm. what part, you know, if I say like, that's not me, whatever I just have said is not me. I now have just given it permission to supercharge yeah. and like wreak havoc yeah. in my life. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's, and I think it's so important around masculinity too, mm -hmm. right? This idea that like when, when I'm, no matter our gender, when we walk into work, for example, all of us walks in to work, right? Mm -hmm. And it is our job to somehow integrate and ground our erotic self in the workplace, right? It is there. Yeah. It is there, but it's sort of like, okay, so you're going to go take a rest while mm -hmm. I get my job done, mm -hmm. but it's there. It's mm -hmm. not like we leave the erotic self somewhere else. It comes with us. Right. And so we have to all figure out how do we do that? Like, how does it come with us? 
while being grounded. Yeah. Like I think about example, you know, just when we think about everything that's happening around harassment in the workplace yeah. and things like that, where it's not, it's clearly coming in the door, right? Yeah. Uh, the erotic self comes in the door with us to work. Right. So we need to know how to like circle it up, ground it, put it in its place. Yeah. Bound, yeah. You know, boundary it. Right. Not boundarying it is different than forbidding it. Right. Because the moment we forbid it, now it has it has no healthy tools at its disposal. So all it has is deception, deceit, manipulation, power, violence. Right. So it's some. That's what I. That's what it. I think, and that that journey begins like in my own reckoning with me. Yeah. So that's why, right? The whole TED talk was about basically just. How do we invite people to reckon with their own erotic self? Because yeah. if I can't reckon with my erotic self, then I'm totally not able to read things that are happening in the space between me and somebody else, and I'm at risk for um, for misusing or you know misusing my sexuality, my power if I don't have it kind of grounded and and held within me. But how the fuck would anybody know how to do that? Because we don't. We don't have these conversations. Sex education either doesn't happen yeah. or it's really fear based. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. What are you, where are you at with this so, question? So, it's interesting because I feel like people like to be able to put people in boxes. And, um, you know, it's interesting because I definitely have like a very strong intellectual side, it's like a huge mm -hmm. part of who I am. Um, but I also have a very playful, creative, erotic side too. And, um, you know, for me, sex outside of a relationship, it's just not of interest. And I haven't had a lot of long-term relationships. And so um, about 10 years ago, I'm like, you know what, I'm not going to keep putting my sexuality and my eroticism on hold until I'm in a relationship. Like I want to, I want to like get intimate with it. And that was when I really got into dancing. And now I do a lot of pole dancing. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of like what first, uh, when you asked me, like, that's what it brought up for me is like, you know, I do it almost every day. It's a huge part of who I am. Yeah. And um, for a while, I didn't share it publicly. I'm like, oh, people are going to think like, this is my profession. And, uh, and then I started. Right, and then you're one of, sorry. And then, and then you're going to, then you're right. one of those women. Then right? I have to explain. Yes. Right, right. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I started sharing it uh, maybe like a year or two ago. And I think, you know, a lot of people, men included, approached me and said, like, I really respect the way you put that out there mm -hmm. and that you're, you're comfortable with it and you're, you're in touch with it. And like, that inspires me to do that. And it's almost like the Brene Brown effect where if I'm vulnerable, then I give you That's permission right. to be vulnerable, yep. which I think the world needs more of. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Because what you, what you do is you invite somebody to say, okay, so I'm all of this. Can yeah. you expand and mm -hmm. hold on to that? Can you resist the urge to put me in a box? Yeah. And it's beautiful. Like that's yeah. a, and if I don't have to put you in a box, then I don't have to put myself right. in a box. So it go like that arrow goes both ways. Yeah. Right. If I know you to be intellectual and I know you to be a pole dancer, now I have to hold all of that. Mm -hmm. That's what I love so much about Stormy Daniels, right? Mm -hmm. Where she just is like, mm -hmm. this is her career. She is her career is as a performer. And she creates erotic content, mm -hmm. and she's smart as mm -hmm. hell, mm -hmm. and she's got this sharp wit. And we have to hold. She she pushes back for whatever notion any of us have about those people over there. She's like, okay, what are you gonna like? That box now has to get yeah. bigger because I'm in that. Like yeah. that is me, and this is me, and yeah. this is me. Yeah. But yeah, I tell you what, getting on that TED stage and like saying out loud that I have that split inside of me. Yeah. I mean, I had this core, like as I was practicing, I had this chorus of all the people, like I believe so much in the message and I still remain very afraid of certain people in my world mm. seeing that talk. Yeah. And I get, I, I, <laughs> I feel like right now, like there are certain people, certain professors yeah. or, you know, people where I think it's really hard for me to know that somebody has watched me say out loud yeah. that I listened to Dr. Ruth, that I have this good girl, bad yeah. girl thing, that I'm fascinated by pleasure and yeah. always have been, and still hold on, still hold on to whatever notion they had of me as a professor. And, yeah. and you know, yeah. it's, but, but it's, I can't not do it because I have watched again and again and again how much havoc this shit wrecks in people's lives when they make these splits. Yeah. And they say, if I'm this, then I'm no longer that. If I'm this, I can't be this. Or about their partner. If you are this, then you can't be that. Yeah. 
you know so yeah. I just am like all right I'm doing it I'm gonna you know say this thing yeah that feels frightening to me like sort of pulling back the curtain on some whatever expanding the definition of what it means to be professional mm -hmm. and to be a bit more like self-revealing and vulnerable because I believe so much in the importance of all of us finding those spots inside of us where yeah. there's that like mismatch and figuring out how to create something that can hold all of it. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That could be a good action step for you guys this week is to find a way to share in an appropriate way, but vulnerably an element of your um, erotic side and, um, you know, see if it opens up for the person that you're speaking to, gives them permission to, you know, share more of their true self mm. as well. I like that. Um, okay. So, uh, um, okay. So moving into your, your newest book, your upcoming book, hold on. I just got an advanced copy. <laughs> Leah got the uh, first signed so copy. Exciting. They just so arrived, they arrived exciting. literally yesterday. Um, so I'm curious, I know the book, um, by Emily Nagoski gets quoted all the time in our group. Um, and I'm curious, there are obviously other books out there. You obviously saw kind of something missing and that you wanted to lend your unique voice to. And I'm curious kind of like what you thought that was and what you're looking to accomplish with the book. Right, oh, that's a great question. I, yeah, so I was coming off of um, the Loving Bravely book and my publishing company was like, okay, so what are you gonna write next? And yeah. I was like, oh no, see, I'm, I'm good. Like, yeah. I, it's like asking like a new mom, yeah. like, when are you having yeah. your next baby? And I was like, no, 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 I'm, I'm good. I wanted to write a book and yeah. I wrote a book. And so that's, yeah. that's good, like yeah. on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. And they were like, well, just, you know, just see if there's anything that you mm -hmm. feel like you want to write about next. And, it was um, like it was I knew before I knew before I wanted to say that I knew right it was like one of those where loving bravely was like what do I want to write this one was like what what is asking to be written it was a really different starting point for a book like this book was asking to be written and at some point it became harder to not write it than to just sit down and be like okay fine yeah <laughs> yeah I will write it and I knew what I wanted to write and I wanted to write something that basically where I imagine the reader I've had so many conversations, I've been blessed to have conversations with my grad students and my undergrad students and, you know, therapy clients and people in my life, especially women, around sex and sexuality and the way I have, I think, teaching the Marriage 101 class, my student, I sit in front of a hundred students who are diverse in every possible way you can mm -hmm. be diverse in terms of every possible like sociodemographic mm -hmm. variable. But in terms of every also aspect of like sexual development, yeah. right? Somebody who's never held hands with somebody yeah. is sitting next to somebody who's like deep in yeah. the poly community. Yeah. <laughs> next somebody who is like doing kink and BDSM. Yeah. Next somebody who will never, it won't touch somebody until they're married. You know, the oh, whole yeah. gamut. Yeah. So I've had to develop a way of talking about sex in the context of intimate partnership or in the sex in the context of self, really. Yeah. You know, outside of relationship status. I've had to figure out ways to teach that and talk about that that can be based in principles that people can use regardless of where they are, regardless of their belief system. Yeah, yeah. So I've developed a, a way of doing that, and it um, and it has led to conversations and people, you know, students saying to me or clients saying to me, like, I haven't, nobody talks about, no one has talked to me about sex in that way before. And yeah. just, like, getting this, it's become clear to me that it's not what, we're given in adolescence, and so we're going into dating and exploring our sexuality and emerging as sexual beings. We're kind of going into that process without really like a wholehearted opportunity to figure out what do I know to be true about me, or how do I, how would I find out what works for me? How, what, what are the parameters even of identifying that does work for me and that doesn't work for me? Mm -hmm. So, that's where the we're taking sexy back comes from yeah. is this idea of um, especially so the book is um, for women or those who've been raised you know socialized in the yeah. feminine yeah. yeah who've been given all these messages about women should women shouldn't women are women aren't and they've internalized all this stuff from yeah. church to family to media to pornography yeah. So they've, they've kind of taken all this in, and so this is an effort to like make a little bit of space and just like invite a process whereby 
you listen from the inside out yeah. to your sexy. So in the book, we kind of like make your sexy. It's yeah. like capital Y, capital S. Mm -hmm. So it's couples therapy mm -hmm. for the reader and her sexy. Mm -hmm. Like, what is this part of you? Like, what do you know to be true? What are the questions you might want to ask it? Yeah. Um, and we go through because I'm because I'm a clinician who works like integratively. Like I use emotion and cognition mm -hmm. and culture and family, we kind of go through all these different like lenses. Yeah. Um, and much like Loving Bravely, it's very much like present some research, some data, some theory, and then, okay, how does it apply to you? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> That's I love just it. How, how I like to write is, is, yeah, the idea and then with the pathway Practical for how do you, yeah. Um, that's right. There was an awesome TED Talk. It's been shared a couple times in the group with Pam Costa on reclaiming female sexual desire. And she starts it with the question, what were the messages you received about sex growing up? And we, we actually did a Facebook Live on it uh, about a year ago. And some of the group members replied, dirty, dirty, dirty. Yeah. Don't talk about it. It's undignified. Men need it more than women. Keep it to yourself. Don't do it too often. It's sinful. Um, we never talked about it growing up. If, if we did, my dad would leave the room. And even my mom was a paradox. She'd sleep with whomever, but taught us that it was bad and that getting knocked up at a young age was the worst thing that ever happened to her. Um, so interestingly, um, earlier this week, someone had Janelle posted in the group. Janelle is, I think Janelle got the award for um, conversation starter. Uh, that's a good award. She comes up with right. the best conversations. And she asked, do you share your sexual fantasies with your partner? And one of the women in the group said, I don't even know what my sexual fantasies are. Um, I'm curious if you have ideas for or offer any resources, like if someone has been kind of so conditioned with messages and kind of so detached from their erotic self, like how can they find out what does it for them? Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a great place to start. I love that as a place to start. Mm -hmm. And I think, I wonder if now that, um, you know, anybody who's, 25 and under has really has grown up in the era of having you know free streaming 24 7 pornography at their fingertips like i think it's for as hard as it's always been to figure out what turns me on it's i think probably even harder now because there's so much available to consume that i think creates it just it creates these internalizations of that's cool that's hot i like that versus like using more an imagination based yeah. like sort of exploration yeah so um, there's a in the in the book there's a huge resource guide okay. um, that's got lots of resources. But I love that as a place to start. Yeah. One of the things actually, one of the exercises in the book is to write an erotic short story. Yes, <laughs> which I, I thought that. was a really fun one because there you really are going from what lives inside of you, what pulls you. So I think that would be maybe a piece of it is just to notice what pulls you. How do you daydream? Yeah. Um, Wow. I think in the world of move, you know, we always have our phones in our hands. Like, yeah. I think we oftentimes now fill up those quiet moments with scrolling. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what might happen as a practice to put your phone away when you are waiting for the bus or waiting in line and just daydream. Because our daydreams may may sort of wander or meander to something yeah. that's erotically tinged. Right. And then we can sort of notice that our interest is pulled. So yeah. That would be, I think, a way to... Um, it's funny because a couple of guys in the group have shared like really uh, incredible erotic poetry and we talked about on February 14th doing like share your erotic poetry within the group, which I think would be cool. That's great. Um, but it's funny because, you know, I mentioned I haven't had like a ton of long term relationships and it used to be a source of like, okay, I'm not going to like talk about that. Like that makes me less than. But what I realize is actually it's kind of had the opposite effect. Like it's forced me to get so uh, in tune with myself mm -hmm. and also created a lot of space for imagination. Um, Esther actually, it's one of my favorite um, Esther Perel quotes of all time. Um, and it's about erotic imagination. Um, I post this quite a bit in the group, but she <laughs> says, animals have sex. It's a primary urge and it's procreative. Humans have an erotic life. We transform sexuality through our imagination, through our creativity, and our ability to anticipate and envision it without actually having it. Eroticism is a place we go inside of ourself, either alone or with others. The focus is not the sexual act, but rather the meaning you give it. 
You can force people to have sex. You can't force them to want it. The wanting is one of the last things that remains profoundly a part of our sovereignty and our freedom. This is my favorite part. The erotic is sexuality transformed by the human imagination. In that sense, it is infinite. Yeah. And yeah, I just, I've always had a really vivid imagination, but I think having, you know, space and, and solitude in your life, like really fuels it. Um, and so that would be another suggestion, like as you're thinking, like give yourself space to have imagination and to uh-huh. like write an erotic story because it's kind of hard to do that if you're next to someone else because you're going to be influenced well what are they thinking about me and what are their desires so i was teaching a few years ago at the u.s coast guard academy wow and um there's their sexual assault so i'm oftentimes brought into military situations to talk about um wow. like, like they'll do like a sexual assault prevention day and i'll come in and talk yeah. about healthy relationships which i yeah. think is a beautiful yeah. way do we want to combat sexual assault? We teach really beautiful, deep, rich, wholehearted, um, just emotional wellness, intelligence, relational education. Obviously, it's not going to reduce it down to zero, but I think, a lot, you know, it just, if everyone needs a chance to have like a really rich education and let their sexuality and their relationships kind of emerge from that great foundation of information. And anyways, so I was teaching and a hand went up and, I, and uh, one of the cadets said, that he he shared his belief that because the campus quarantines, you know, their Wi-Fi is set so that pornography cannot mm-hmm. enter the campus, his belief was that increased the sex the chances of sexual assault wow. because wow. the cadets didn't have an yeah. opportunity to, you know, play it out that yeah. way. Interesting. And, and where I went with it was I actually think you have a beautiful chance without yeah. to be 19, 18, 20 and have no access to pornography because you actually now need to cultivate erotic imagination. So you have basically four years to cultivate the heck (laughs) out of your erotic imagination. And that's, who knows where you go with that, but it is, it's sort of neither here nor there. You know, sexual assault is clearly bigger, you know, that's a problem bigger than whether or not a campus has pornography on it. But just what I wanted to highlight back to him was this idea that actually to listen from within to what turns you on and where you go inside your own yeah. freaky mind is a really beautiful. 100%. Yeah. So. I love that. Um, so this is a little bit of a segue, but um, one of our group members um, who asked to be anonymous, I promised that I would read her question. And it's about um, trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, so her first this is an anonymous woman. Her first sexual experience was being raped about 20 years ago. And since then, her body's instinct um, when intercourse is imminent is to shut down, even when she's in a safe, committed relationship with someone. She said, even if I want to share sex with them, I'm a very physical, playful person and enjoy other forms of sex quite a bit. But my body immediately tightens up when a penis enters me. I've done lots of therapy, including EMDR and somatic experiencing, but I still have that tightening involuntary response. Like, is that something I'll always have or is there anything I can do? That's a beautiful, courageous yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I love kind of how aware she is and I love that she has, she's kept some complexity to yeah. her own story yeah. around like, I am playful, yeah. I am sexual, yeah. I do enjoy touch. Like that's so beautiful. So mm-hmm. she's, I like that she's not letting yeah. this one area define all of her. Yeah. So I love that. Um, I love, you know, EMDR is so important for survivors mm-hmm. of trauma. Mm-hmm. I think that, um, you know, there's, there's, when there's a trauma, there is the, the trauma work that helps to, um, to heal the trauma, but then there's this entire piece of like sort of erotic recovery, mm-hmm. right, of sort of um, reclamation of the erotic self, of the sexual self. And so it sounds like she is yeah. doing that, and she's had a lot of progress, but there's this kind of um, a, a, pain, a pain point, literally emotionally, yeah. physically a pain point around penetration. Yeah. I loved in your conversation with Chris Maxwell, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm when she was really highlighting that penetration, like to be entered yeah. is really significant. Yeah. And so it is not to be taken lightly. And so just to really like highlight that it, it makes sense for a lot of reasons yeah. that that is an area that remains vulnerable. It makes me think also how in heterosexual sex, we have made this 
hierarchy. And yeah. we have said that penetration is the most sex sex. Yeah. So I would want her really to remember that all these other kinds of sex are really working for her. Yeah. So to celebrate that. Yeah. Um, so that that, I think there's a way that if, if the story is I can't do this one thing, that gets energized and yeah. focused on. Yeah. What I would want her to be focusing on is all these other things that yeah. she really can find pleasure from mm -hmm. and that that maybe the more she can take attention away yeah. from the things she can't do right. by focusing on the things she can do and does enjoy, right. it may be that that one just sort of resolves. Yeah. Yeah. I, of course, want her to talk to a sex therapist yeah. who's really well-trained in vaginismus. So mm -hmm. she, um, I would want her to have, there might be some really lovely practices that are around her own touch mm -hmm. and using, um, you know, vibrators, things mm -hmm. that are tools that are sort of increasingly larger mm -hmm. and being able to really work on pairing mindfulness yeah. with penetration where it's really her in the yeah. driver's seat and she's maybe working with this really wonderful clinician who's helping mm -hmm. her kind of um, challenge, come back and report on how that was. Yeah. So it's a process that she really feels like she's got some mastery yeah. around. The gal who wrote the foreword to Taking Sexy Back is Dr. Lori Brado, mm -hmm. and she is a really preeminent women's sexuality researcher in Canada. Okay. And her book is called um, Better Sex Through Mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And she created a mindfulness training program for women with sexual problems, and she has beautiful mm -hmm. results. So oh, it may great. be that some mindfulness practices yeah. support her yeah. as well. Um, I like what you said about taking penis and vagina sex off the pedestal and stop making it like the hierarchy or kind of like the pinnacle. Yeah. I think um, it's so important yeah. also for men, right? Yeah. I think there's so much we get, when we, when we hold that kind of sex up above any other kind of sex, it creates the conditions for fear around erections and performance and premature ejaculation, whatever the hell that means, yeah. you know, like it just right, sort of, right. we put all this focus on that, that I think, does as much disservice to men right. as it does to women when there are so many like avenues for yeah. pleasure and for orgasm yeah. and, for, and for connection. Yeah, I know in the book you talk about kind of this fallacy of the organism, of the orgasm as the gold star. Right. Um, but it's interesting because, so one of our rock star group members, Sean Kinney, um, he also is a great conversation starter. And he's been posting, you know, the Gottman's cards so he's been posting, essentially, these are like question starter cards for building intimacy. Um, and one of the questions he posted was, some men say there are erotic parts of their body that are almost entirely neglected by their partner. Is this true for you? If so, what parts? Mm -hmm. And a lot of men responded. And the majority of their responses were my mind or my imagination. Oh, I <laughs> this is could not love that <laughs> more than I do. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Oh. So for men. That actually kind of brings a tear to my I eye, know. like a chill. It's yeah. so beautiful. We have sold men so I short. I know. Right? I know. Yeah. Um, right. So shout out to the guys in our group. Mm -hmm. So for the men who are feeling that way, how can they create a conversation around that with their partners? <laughs> how would that? Well, I, I love the idea of it starting. Like, I think it's so much easier to start these conversations with a thing, like a movie or a book or a podcast episode or Sean Kinney's <laughs> question. So I love that. Like, what a segue that is. Like, hey, you know yeah. I'm part of the Esther yeah. discussion group. There's this really interesting question yeah. today. and Like, that's a beautiful yeah. starter because it has a bit of distance. Right? Yeah. It's less vulnerable than... I'd like to tell yeah. you about a part of me that's, you know, yeah. I think that there's, so yeah. I don't like that. That's great. Mm -hmm. It's more like, like, oh, just like, just thought of this. Like we were talking about this in the group. What do you think? Yeah. Conversation. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay. My last question. And then um, I want you to talk a little bit about how people can find you okay. and engage with you. So, um, so this was another Sean Kinney question um, from the Gottman cards. And um, so this was a question for men. So it goes, many men say they enjoy giving oral sex. Is this true for you? And one of the women responded, uh, she has to be anonymous. She said, my husband says he'll do it, but he doesn't enjoy it. I love it, but I can't enjoy it knowing that he doesn't. What do you do when one partner's pleasure is another's have to? Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's, that's a really rich, <laughs> juicy question. Yeah. I, what I would want 
to, if I was the couples therapist yeah. in the situation, I would want to un better understand for him what the, like, what the, I don't, to say he didn't let, he didn't he enjoy was willing it. to do it he didn't yeah. enjoy it so I'd like to explore what that is, you know what is like why mm -hmm. what that, what's that about because mm -hmm. what what I'm guessing happens in the space between them is the more he feels like he has to the more she's self-conscious the more she's self-conscious the less likely she is to orgasm mm -hmm. the more you know sort of the longer it's yeah. taking maybe <laughs> the more it feels like I have to so I could imagine yeah. this we have to always frame anything that has to do with sex. We have to always figure out how to frame it as a couple problem or mm -hmm. a couple dynamic because mm -hmm. there's a dynamic, right? Yeah. It's not that his have to exists in a separate right. silo from her um, guilt, right? right. Those are, they're interconnected. Right. So I would be curious to kind of hear a bit more about what his, um, is, what his not issue, what his sort of challenge is yeah. around it. And I think it makes, it, it makes sense, right? We, this has been a part of, our culture has not held the vulva in the kind of like warm regard that it really yeah. should. Right? I think yeah. a lot of men and women grow up thinking that it's dirty yeah. and it doesn't smell good, yeah. and it does, you know, there's sort of a lot. There's a lot of yeah. contempt for yeah. like, when you think about the things you can call a man if you want to insult a man. Right. What do you call him? The vast majority of things you call him yeah. a pussy mm -hmm. or a mm -hmm. cunt. Mm -hmm. You know, like these, there are these words yeah. that are that part of a woman's body. Yeah. So he may have some some yeah. grief and rage that would be helpful to process around like that is such a mind fuck yeah to teach a man that when you're being weak you're being a pussy but now you need to also enjoy that pussy you know yeah. like it just is so confusing yeah it's so complicated yeah so there may be i wonder if it's like shedding some of that messaging or at least looking at it or questioning it and then stepping into a space where he can feel really like powerful like very yeah. powerful and very loving yeah to bring her pleasure in that way yeah. and I would want her to be able to talk to him about what that pleasure is like yeah. and the, the journey that it takes her on the kind of ecstasy that she yeah. can access when he is present to her yeah. in that way because then as she, the more she's able to kind of like as she sheds her shame and says like I love this and yeah. I just and it, it is it's this for me it's yeah. this for me then he can feel more like okay you know like that that's so I think they have to kind of change each of the positions in the dance yeah. and maybe collectively grieve that that we're all sort of sold a bill of goods yeah. around yeah. just the like beauty and pleasure potential of a woman's vulva. Yeah. You know? I love that. And <laughs> you know, Esther talks a lot about it's never the act with the meaning that we mm -hmm. attribute to it. And so if she can share that with him, like it's not just that it feels X, Y, and Z, but this is this is like what I make it mean when you're able to to do that for him, yeah, I think yeah, could yeah. be powerful for a man to hear too. Because if they as a couple change the meaning, yeah. it changes the entire thing. Yeah. If right now it is a task to check off, no wonder nobody's enjoying it. Right. Versus if they kind of have this different story yeah. about what happens when we as a couple yeah. go to that place mm -hmm. together, yeah. it's a whole different experience. Yeah, I love that. Okay, I feel like ending on oral sex is always a good way to go. <laughs> so, so with that, um, so you have your new book um, coming out in February. Do you want to share a little bit about where people can find it and you? Yes. So it's available in all the like places you would think, Amazon and Barnes and Noble. But one thing that's fun that we're doing is this pre-order campaign. Where we've partnered with independent bookstores around the country. And when you order from one of them, you get this a free um, journal that we, I should have brought a journal with me. Yeah. We created these, these journals that are, yeah. um, there's original art in this book that I love. So here's an example. Of, oh, so cool. Um, yeah. So we created a journal with, with an image from the book. Oh. And so if you go to dralexandrosolomon.com slash pre-order, then you can see there are links there to the independent bookstores we partner with. If you pre-order through those, you get the free journal. Love it. Um, otherwise, Barnes and Noble, Amazon, and it comes out February second. Awesome. So great. So sorry, guys, we couldn't get to all of your amazing comments, but I'm sure we'll go back through and share resources as we can. Um, but I always like to end with a note of gratitude for your time and for your involvement in the group and for you know, the commitment and passion that you bring to this work. Um, and I have a couple little presents Aww, for you. Oh my gosh. So that's amazing. Actually the first one, I'll, I'll save the, like the fun juicy one for last. <laughs> um, so the first one is um, in your, in your first book, Loving Bravely, 
you mentioned the idea of kintsugi, which is the Japanese art of golden repair. And I had actually first heard about it on a podcast with Lewis Howes and mm-hmm. Candice Kumai. I don't know if you're, are you familiar with Candace I know Lewis Howes. No. Okay, so Candice is so interesting. She was on the first season of Top Chef. She was a former model um, and she was a writer for different media outlets as well. Uh, But she had a really, really explosive breakup. And, uh, you know, she's the daughter of a Japanese mom and um, her father met her mom during the war, um, during the Vietnam War, and um, really identifies with her, you know, with those different aspects of her cultural background. And so she had this, she had this like explosive breakup and she was sitting with her publisher and they were talking about the next book. And she's like, I think I should really write like clean green wellness or like, you know, she's, Mm -hmm. she's like at this time kind of a prolific author. And her publisher was like, I really think it's time to write the, you know, the book about your story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was almost like she had this really painful experience and she was going to go on like the hero's journey. Yeah. So she goes and she learns all about her culture and she writes this book called um, Kintsuki Wellness. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Aww. Yeah. So, um, and it's essentially the idea that what breaks us makes us more beautiful. You know, oftentimes we try to har- hide the parts of ourselves that feel broken, you know, like our, um, our anonymous friend who shared about her trauma yes. or the woman, you know, um, struggling with oral sex with her, uh, with her partner. Uh, but this book shows how it can really be like the most beautiful parts of ourselves, And uh, it's, it's interspersed with like recipes and uh, stories from her family. So this is for you. And I'll send you the I'm interview so, she did. It's gorgeous. Look yeah, at the book too. Yeah, yeah. It's beautiful. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I'll send you the interview she did with Lewis because she actually reminds me a little bit of you. Like mm-hmm. you kind of have similar mannerisms and have like similar um, personality. Um, and, and she's just so articulate and interesting. Mm-hmm. So I'll send you that. And then the second one, um, so this was also inspired by Sean Kinney. Sean first posted this in the group maybe like a year ago, and it's one of my favorites. So I printed it and blew it up. And it's, um, do you know this? I do know this, but I've never <laughs> had one this size. So oh. If you guys can see this. So it's called like the map of human sexuality. And each country is like a fictitious country with a different kink. I feel like so often, um, so I often. I am so excited <laughs> about this. Oh, it's beautiful. I feel like so often there are like certain kinks that get special attention and others are kind right. of forgotten about. So, I mean, speaking of like discovering your sexual fantasies, this could be, you know, an interesting place it's to beautiful, start. Beautiful, right. So. Kingdom of Furry, <laughs> Vampire Erotica. Oh, that was so, so sweet. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so with that, hopefully we'll catch you at the book signing coming up. What is it? February 9th? February 6th, February 6th. We'll be at, um, I'll be at Women and Children First okay. with Gigi Engel, who okay. is also writing, uh, is coming out with her book. Okay. And then February 8th, I'll be at the Bookstall in Lynetka. Okay. Okay. And then there's an event in LA with um, August McLaughlin oh. from Girl Boner. Oh, and then well, there'll be events in uh, New York and DC in okay. like April. Okay, great. So. Mike Harris. You can catch Dr. Solomon live on the East Coast. Okay, so with that, thank you guys so much. Um, We've got so many people engaging, so I'll follow up with all of you once we wrap, and you can catch this on demand or on replay anytime you like in the group. And, you know, let us know what resonated. Let us know what additional questions you have. And our next Facebook Live is going to be February 26th. I'm going to be talking with sexologist and founder of Dame, which is a company. um, One of the things they do is they create vibrators that are tested by and made for women, but they also do a lot of research around the pleasure gap. So the fact, and you talk about this in Loving Bravely, the fact that, you know, women are orgasming at a much lower rate than men, um, and they get tons of interesting questions that they're going to talk about, their most frequently submitted questions. So that should be really uh, a really fun one. I'm going to be in New York for that. So catch that, and um, we'll see everyone in the group later. Thank you, Leah. That was really fun. Yeah, thanks again. Okay, bye, guys.